Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a new episode of Debriefed. Today, I am joined by somebody very special who I've just come to know. This is Don Don Derry, professor, um, associate he, professor, associate professor with. I mean, how many years at, at McGill? At 30? McGill, uh, forty-seven. Forty-seven years, uh, tenured professor, associate professor at McGill, a professor of uh, psychology, I believe. Correct. Um, and what's really interesting about uh, Don is Don is probably the only person that I know of, uh, at any rate, who taught a course. On UFOs, is that correct? That's correct. And the McGill Community for Lifelong Learning for adults who'd already graduated and were just coming back for more. That is incredible. And what, I mean, we've spoken a little bit about, uh, about this off camera. Before I get into this, though, I do want to encourage you guys to, uh, you know, do all the things. Go uh, hit the like button, subscribe, uh, and leave us a review on uh, Spotify or iTunes or wherever it is you're watching it from. It really helps us out. And go check out some of these books. So these books. Both these books here are by Don Don Derry. Uh, what uh, we have UFOs, ETs, and alien abductions: A Scientist's Look at the Evidence. Mm-hmm. And then we have his latest one: Truth, Lies, and ETs: How We Stumbled into the Universe. So I'll leave the links below to that. You guys can check that out. Thank you. No problem. So where do we start? Where well, that's we... a good question. Where do you want to start? If I go back to where I began with this subject, it was in about 1965. I was at McGill. I was, by that time, tenured, which meant I couldn't be fired for opening my mouth on unpleasant subjects. And I began to realize that the evidence that people were presenting in the newspapers and on radio in those days mostly, that they were seeing things in the sky, was fascinating to me. And I go back a little further because I remember as a kid reading about this stuff, and I mentioned this in some of my books, In about 1947, UFOs began to make their way into the public media Mm. in the U.S. where I grew up. And that was in things like Look Magazine and in newspaper headlines. And that interested me. In 47, I was uh, 10 years old. I was a little too young to pursue the subject in detail. But it got my attention then. And then later on, when I got to be older and actually had a steady job from mm-hmm. which I could not get fired, mm-hmm. I took it up seriously as a as a psych prof at McGill. When, when did you? Uh, when was the year that you uh, started this course? Well, the course came much later. Much later. My yeah. interest began in 1965. The courses mm-hmm. at McGill in the Community for Lifelong Learning started in the uh, mid uh, 80s, 90s. Wow. Uh, they they were much later on. Yeah. So that was. Uh, I mean. That must have been a really exciting time because even nowadays we look at the stigma associated with UFOs and ETs and abductions mm-hmm. and all of this, and there still is a stigma, but it's 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 uh, dissipating. Mm-hmm. But back then, it must have been you must have found a little bit of pushback, I would assume. Funnily enough, no. I lived in a very good environment. I give credit now to the psych department at McGill for having never given me a moment of trouble about this. Wow. I had tenure, to be fair, yeah. which meant they couldn't fire they me couldn't for say my anything. opinions. <laughs> but people didn't. They didn't make it hard for me. And I even had a university administrative job after that mm. in the 70s. So I got kicked upstairs, so to speak, to deal with a graduate faculty s- fellowships and scholarships, which uh. is a fairly responsible job, yeah. after I had gone public with this stuff. And so even my seniors at McGill Mm-hmm. were tolerant of my interests and didn't suppress me, so to speak. So I have to say, with all credit to McGill, I never felt a moment of uh, upset mm. from them by having taken this subject up. I mean, that's, that's it. That's amazing. I feel good about it. <laughs> I would feel great about that, too. Um, I mean, that's that's such an interesting thing uh to to discuss nowadays is you know the teaching of you i i suspect that in 50 years time you might have been well ahead uh, well ahead of the uh the rest of us because i i suspect that eventually you know this will become public knowledge uh that ufos are out there that they exist and that we're possibly interacting with them i think that there probably will be courses on ufos i suspect that that's something that's gonna happen we're in the middle of that transition right now Mm. i think all the publicity that came out 
from the, uh, well, for one thing, that Senate hearing in 2023 yep. in the U.S. Yep. made a big difference. It made it visible to the public. Now, it's been visible to the people interested in this for That's years, right. like you and me and our friends. Yep. They've always been interested. And the, there's always been a small fraction of the public that's been interested, has been writing about this, has been uh, talking to each other about it uh, yep. on social media and what have you. Yep. But now it's become more public with those U.S. Senate hearings. The U.S. government is still lying about the mm. subject, but the Senate was not, at least. That's and right. the public people who appeared yeah. in the mid-2023 uh, about that mm -hmm. have really made a difference. Yeah, I'm knocking impressed. on some doors, ruffling some feathers. Absolutely. Uh, you know, especially with all the, the talk about the private corporations who, yes. you know, possibly retrieve these craft and are reverse mm -hmm. engineering mm -hmm. them. Uh, let's go back a little bit into into some maybe some of this and some of your knowledge of UFOs. So, what do you uh, credit your uh, your 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 repertoire and your and your knowledge of all these uh, all these things that you that you have in your books? What do you what do you credit that to? I credit it to curiosity, mm -hmm. seriously, and protected curiosity. Remember, I, I've got, it's a little boring to go over it again, not to you, not to the podcast people, but to the public who may not realize how protected an academic is when he or she has tenure. Yeah, that is, unless you're immoral or don't show up for work. You've got a job yeah. for life or for your professional life. Mm -hmm. And I had one. And I also had, as a psychology professor, interested in human visual perception, which is how you see things, and memory, which is how you remember them, mm -hmm. the fact that people have been reporting these things for years and the academic public was scoffing. Yeah. And I thought this was ridiculous on the basis of the evidence. So I had been interested as a kid in 1947, when I was 10 years old, I began to read about it in the magazines that were widely circulated in the U.S. where I lived at the time. So, so you, 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 uh, you heard about Roswell. I did, indeed. When you were a young man. Well, I think I probably heard about whatever was going on in 1947. Those first sightings that people were having yeah. were publicized in magazines like the uh, Saturday Evening Post and others. And I read them. And that kept me interested in the back of my head. I had no obviously place to put that interest other than when I got to McGill and had a platform mm. where I could speak, as I said, without losing my job, without the boss coming in and saying, Don, we've heard enough of this. Would you please find another job? That didn't <laughs> happen to me. Now, that my, my, my colleagues may have thought so, but yeah. they were prevented from saying so by the rules, and I appreciated that. <laughs> thank you, McGill. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you, McGill. Yeah. Um, What's uh so in in this I'm I'm really curious about this this course but before I, I I get into this where does the information come from uh that you've acquired through the years is this uh, I, I guess meeting with other like-minded folk uh where where did you where did you acquire this knowledge that you have about these crafts well about, okay. a lot of it by myself mm -hmm. that is reading the books that have been published for years about the subject yeah. there's always been a ufo culture mm -hmm. in north america uh, that is groups of people who have been interested in it for well i was you know, probably since back into the 50s yeah. when i was growing up there was a culture it grew and it was no, most noticeable and still is online mm -hmm. you can find many people online there's an organization called the mutual ufo network that's right which is big which has lots of members in lots of parts of North America and Canada, mm -hmm. and which is interested in the subject. There are similar organizations in Europe, in France, Japan it's called, I can't recall the exact meaning of the initials, mm -hmm. in UK, in other places, where there are interested people have always been able to gather in public in open societies right. and talk to each other about this and write books about it and write papers and have conferences. And I've been interested in that for as long as those organizations have existed. And when I was uh, an adult and able to find and read this stuff mm -hmm. as an academic with computers for the first time, and you can find things online, mm -hmm. I started to collect information and, and keep my keep my interest active. Mm. And again, I've been a member of that organization called the Mutual UFO no Network for many years, yeah. and some of its predecessors as well. Have you been able, have you ever had an encounter yourself? No. No encounters, uh, but you've uh, met no. with I have, so, sorry, I've had a counter. I once saw a UFO, a, a glowing orb in the sky at a great distance. And this is probably interesting because many people may have seen this without bothering to report it, and I never did. Right. I was standing, looking out the 
upstairs back porch when we lived on Beaconsfield Avenue in Montreal back in the 80s, I think early 80s. And I was taking a break from my work, which was in an upstairs study, went out, looked out, out the window on the porch, and there I saw a UFO gradually going through the sky in that, uh, sk uh, that motion, that skimming motion that everybody has reported. But this was just a, a nocturnal light, as they say. Mm. And so in the list of important UFO sightings, it rates way down there somewhere. But it was my UFO sighting. That's right. And I know that's what it was because airplanes don't do that. And yeah. I was well enough equipped with eyes so that I knew that I wasn't making it up. That must have been very exciting at the time. It was, but it was just confirmatory to me because yeah. by that time I was already... You were already a believer. In, uh, a believer. And now I you were a knower. Now I'm a knower. Yes, all right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I put the word belief in a professional way mm. to mean, uh, how shall I put it? I've read a lot of stuff, as mm. anyone would who's interested in this subject. And yeah. it's all out there to read. I'm currently, uh, I'm currently in the middle of reading uh, J. Allen Hynek's... Oh, that old book, the yeah. first one he wrote. Yeah, yeah exactly, the first one yeah. uh, about about you know his time at Blue Book. and Right, right. That's a fascinating book. Yeah, what was it called? I can't recall the title right now, but it's a very interesting book. Yeah, I, I have it. it here. I don't yeah. recall it. It's a, l a lengthier title, but uh, but yeah. the contents are really fascinating because oh, yeah. yeah. uh, not only does he uh, go in great detail through you know a lot of the cases mm -hmm. that were reported to the government mm -hmm. uh, to, mm -hmm. right. uh, during Project Blue Book, but also he was an astronomer. Yes, and that gives you a really unique perspective on what it is we're seeing in the sky. Yes. And it's really important to know for people out there uh, that things are explainable. Even yeah. though, you know, someone like me who might not have all the knowledge in the world, I might see something and, and, and to me it's unidentified. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it could be a planet. Correct. It could be a fireball like a, like a meteor mm -hmm. or a weather balloon. You know, mm -hmm. we've heard all mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. But it was his job to quote unquote debunk these in project blue book yes exactly. that's yes. right yeah <laughs> very very fascinating right. uh, oh he was an interesting i met him once he came to mcgill to give a lecture he came to montreal to give a lecture and mm, i really? met him in the in the so like preparation for that lecture that's mm. all and just just to meet not to not to deal with it in any great way but i'm very impressed by the books he wrote i mm. really am yeah um I'm also aware of you were involved with a case if i'm not mistaken uh at the Brooklyn Bridge, if uh, an abduction case, uh, uh, yes, very famous yes, one. Yes, I was. Would, that, would you care to talk about sure. that a little bit? That was a case that was looked into by a friend of mine, Bud Hopkins, mm -hmm. who was a an artist, a, a, an abstract expressionist painter, and also interested because of people he knew who'd had these experiences in UFO encounters and abduction encounters. And I met Bud years ago at a conference in uh, MIT, mm. in which he was one of the speakers, and I was also one of the speakers. And we got to be friends, and I visited Bud in his, uh, his uh, walk-up in uh, the Lower East Side mm -hmm. uh, and uh, got to know him. And Bud and I were friends, and he had dealt with people who had met people independently of his trade as an artist, who'd had these kind of experiences and written about them in a book called Missing Time. And so Bud and I got to be friends. I met him, went to his house, met his other friend, Leslie Kane, who's a journalist who'd written about those, and we got to know each other pretty well. So that's that's the truth. And, and uh, what uh, for those for those people who don't know anything about this story, what is a little bit about the history about uh, about this, this book, Missing Time, and, and this particular case that happened? Oh, well, Bud knew abductees he'd mm -hmm. met in the New York City area mm -hmm. and took their encount encounters very seriously. And one person who's mentioned in one of his books as Linda Cortili, which is not her real name, but she still wants to keep that secret, lived in Brooklyn and was inducted out her window from a high-rise apartment within view of the Brooklyn Bridge. That sighting was well reported by people who seen it on the ground. It was well reviewed by people who'd study the evidence, including Bud, who wrote a book about it, and that was part of Missing Time. And I got into this because I met his acquaintance, Linda Cortilli, and some of the other people who met, who uh, saw this event. So you One, met the, the lady? Yes, I met the lady, yeah, wow. at, at Bud's house, yeah. And it was most fun. Now, I've been close to some of these people uh, a long time ago. This was back in the 90s. And this world has been in review, so to speak, by capable people who've been writing about it. When writing was the thing people did, they didn't yeah. do podcasts then because <laughs> they didn't know how. But uh, when things got put into books, 
people I knew were writing about them. Wow. Uh, people like David Jacobs and Bud Hopkins and others. And uh, at this, as I said, I mentioned a conference at MIT in the 90s where a lot of people who had written about it went to a conference sponsored by a group centered on MIT, not by the university itself. Mm -hmm. But it was one of the first really public, academic, quote-unquote, events that took this seriously. Yeah. And that book was published in 1990-something. I can't recall the exact year. We'll, uh, we'll bring it up. Uh, I'll put it in the link below as well. I'll Thank do you. my own Good. research and have a look at that. Good. Um, all right, let's talk, let's talk crafts. For right, a second crafts. Here. Yeah, okay. these not arts and crafts, but uh, <laughs> flying crafts, sure. crafts of a different nature. Okay. Um, there are so many different types of crafts that are reported over the years. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, in this area, there's a, there's a lot of reportings as well. But uh, we've seen saucers, we've seen cigars, mm -hmm. tic tacs, mm -hmm. uh, giant triangles, mm -hmm. orbs. Do you think this is my personal sort of take on it? But this, there's got to be more than one type. I agree with you, and there's quite likely more than one type of observer in That's these right. machines as well. I don't know that. Yeah. In my book, I have a couple of sketches borrowed from other people of various types of ETs, mm -hmm. some of whom look more like us, some of whom don't. They're mostly bipedal, as far as I know, mm -hmm. and they all have two arms, two legs, and a head. And the other thing they do is they do telepathy, right. and they can control us telepathically. Mm. The one thing you won't hear much about, and this is something that needs more publicity, and I'm glad I can make this case here, there seems to be a way to protect yourself from it by putting on a helmet that covers your head with plastic that dis that basically disturbs electromagnetic radiation. Really? And this is, this is, as far as I know, known, but not widely known. The discovery was made by a man named Michael Mencken, who lived somewhere near Seattle, Washington, and who developed a helmet with sheets of non-transmitting uh, electrical uh, in insulators that you could put inside a hat and protect yourself from the telepathic instructions that you were getting from ETs who wanted to abduct you. Now, wow. this is not even widely accepted in the ET world. Right. I put it in my book because I thought Mencken was credible. I've talked to him a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if he's still alive, to be honest. But he discovered this himself in dealing with his own UFO experiences and prevented future abductions. And wow. the abductions are controlled by telepathy. If they're standing over there and mm -hmm. they can't control you telepathically, you can pick your twenty two off the wall and threaten to shoot them. Right. If you have a twenty two on the wall, which you may or may not. <laughs> do you do you think they're hostile? No. I don't think they're deliberately hostile. I think right. they're curious. I see. And they're maybe a bit interventionist, as we are with other species on Earth. Mm. We're not quote hostile, unquote to raccoons or to, uh, mm. or to, well, we are hostile to rats in the walls, for sure. sure yeah. But we're not hostile to a lot of animals we investigate and, and study. Right. Bears in the woods, deer in the woods. We shoot them. We also are interested in them. And the better intended of us go and look for them, look at them, mm. try and be nice to them. The less well-intended of us still go out and shoot them for meat. But mm. in between, there's an attitude, which is curiosity, which you might call scientific curiosity, and I think they have that curiosity towards us. Whether they're interested in doing more or not mm -hmm. is an open question I can't answer. But they're certainly interested in looking and yeah. exploring, that's for sure. That's, uh, you know, I'm reminded of uh, Betty and Barney Hill. Oh, yeah. Very famous case. Yes, indeed. Also Project Blue Book, I believe. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and in there, through their hypnotherapy sessions, especially Betty had an encounter where she... Mm -hmm. Uh, basically had a conversation with one of these beings yes. and the being told her that uh, this is like a like you could tell by the conversation they they apparently had was that they didn't know much about us uh, you know they were asking about oh, her curious. teeth and why that's right that's and why right. uh, she, that's right. why her teeth didn't come out <laughs> we've read the same books yeah, yeah. That's right. and, and then that's right and also asking you know about um, uh, they didn't understand the concept of age right of uh, right. you know so there was uh, it, it seemed to me for the first time because I would assume that beings who can buzz around the universe at free will would know everything and it seemed that they didn't 
pardon me for reminding you, the universe is a very big place. <laughs> yeah. And they come in all sorts of ships, as I'm sure you know as well. Mm -hmm. Big ones, smaller ones, probably some that sit inside others until they're about to launch a, a local visit, just right. like a, like a, a small mothership. A mothership and so forth and so on. And as a matter of fact, uh, Kath, uh, Barney and Betty's niece, Kathleen Martin, is very interested in the subject, is a friend, and has written about it as well, as I'm sure you also know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, they are interested. They were interested back then. They probably still are, that mm -hmm. back then being in the 40s. They undoubtedly still are because they haven't learned everything they need to know. And they're keeping a watching brief, at the very least, on humanity, for yeah. sure. I mean, and just like just like us, like you mentioned, I mean, we all have, you know, uh, different motives and different agendas yeah. that oh, gosh, uh, yes. not everyone, uh, even internally as a species— we're so, not all nice to each other. Exactly. Sure. So, you yeah. know, it's it's one thing to assume that, you know, just because they all sort of look the same to us or that they all behave the same way. But, uh, you know, if you were if you were to float above the earth, you would quickly realize that there's conflict between us. Oh, yes. uh, hard to believe, but that's the no, case. The, the conflict is real. It's saddening. Yeah. But we're not perfect beings. Goodness knows. Have you heard of... Um, he he was the head of the Israeli space program. Uh, I am a shed. I'm probably butchering his name at the moment. I can pull it up. Uh, have you heard of his accounts? Not no. The name is vaguely familiar, but I'm sorry. I'm in the same boat you're in. I'd have to pull out my cell phone to look too. So uh, yeah. this this gentleman, he was yeah. he was. Uh, I'm going to pull out just just okay. because I, I want people to uh, okay to make sure. Sorry we got about his name, this. Right? Sorry, I can't help. As no, the, as the, as I, sh I should have been more prepared. prepared. Okay. Um, Israeli space program. Uh, Haim Eshed. That is that okay. is his uh, that is his name. So he was this guy was head of the Israeli space program in his lifetime. He put up thirteen satellites into space. So yeah. he was, for lack of a better comparison, he was their Werner von Braun. And okay, probably yeah. the worst comparison I could have made <laughs> <laughs> for, for many reasons. Well, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, but all that to say is that he came out on a talk show one day and started, quote unquote, spilling the beans Okay, and said that we are part of a galactic federation, that we've been working with these ETs, that he's been working with them in creating all sorts of technologies, which he's won awards for. And, and, to, and those technologies still to this day, they can't tell us what, what he won mm -hmm. like or how he won it. Mm -hmm. And he said basically that, and this is the one thing that I found really interesting, that we're basically a Petri dish mm -hmm. and that these guys are bouncing around to 10,000 other planets just like ours, mm -hmm. dropping off technology mm -hmm. and watching us grow and sort of helping us along. Um, is that... Does that ever cross your mind, something like that? Do you ever think about things like that? What you've just told me is vaguely familiar, but I've never followed it up. Mm -hmm. So the concept is not unreasonable. Goodness knows, they're bopping around the universe. They have the machines to do it, and not just at this planet. That's for sure, because the machines come from elsewhere. Yeah. But I can't add information to what you've just said, because mm -hmm. I know that little about it. Yeah. But the concept is clear to me. For one thing... There are big reports that I've put in my books and other people have well documented of giant UFOs, mm -hmm. huge machines, globes that are a quarter of a mile around wow. going low over the Arctic or northern regions of Canada. This stuff is well documented from way back. <clears throat> that is sightings of ships like this, but no direct connection between those sightings, which are documented, mm -hmm. and events that are taking place. Now, I have no doubt, and this, I hope, listeners and viewers will not think is a conspiracy theory because it's not but it's so obvious that this evidence has been accumulating for so many years that it's equally obvious without paying any attention to conspiracy mm -hmm. that somebody in official positions has been paying attention and knows a heck of a lot more about this than you and I who are reasonably well informed amateurs yeah. about this subject know yeah. so I have no doubt that a lot more is going on than we know about because other people have been paying closer attention to it than we as lay people in the outer world can ever know. Well put. What is, Don, what is one of the cases that sticks out to you the most throughout the years? I mean, you've, you've, you've been a part of the subject for decades and, and known a lot about it. What's, what's a case that springs to the front of your mind 
when I mention perhaps abductions? Well, I met Kathleen Morton, who's the niece of Barney and Betty, and so I know about that well-known abduction, but so does everybody else because it's been written uh, well about. Yeah. I don't know any direct abduction stories from this neighborhood, that is from mm. Quebec, Montreal, the Laurentians. I do know people up here who've had close encounters with uh, UFOs, mm -hmm. and you do too, because mm -hmm. they come from this neighborhood, the saint Savour, St. Adolphe de Howard neighborhood, and other places around here yeah. where close encounters have taken place. In Montreal, which is where I live and have for the last six, oh, well, since 1962, quite a while, uh, I don't know of any direct abduction cases, but there are certainly plenty of UFO sightings. Is, th is there any sighting in particular that stands out to you throughout uh, throughout maybe your studies or something mm -hmm. that you've looked into that you might be able to share with uh, with the listeners? Just something uh, something that really like struck you as oh this this is very credible. This is very important. Like, is there anything? Well, the close encounter I talked about with uh, a guy who lives in uh, Saint Adolphe de Howard mm -hmm. was a very real one. Because he explained it, we were up there, uh, Luigi and I, and my wife as well, at different times, to meet the observer of mm -hmm. this within uh, a, a month at least of when it happened. And we sat in his, uh, stayed overnight at his house, as a matter of fact, sat and talked to them about right. that very close encounter, which may have been preceded and followed by other close encounters as well, from this neighborhood, basically, this neck of the woods. Yeah, And that was a very close uh eyewitness account of something that uh, I only participated in as a second-hand spectator, but got very close to the actual observers of. Mm -hmm. And other than that, in the general Montreal area, no, I'm a damn academic, put it that way. I do a lot of my learning through reading other people's books, sure. and a lot of it comes from there, as well as my interest. And, for example, this close encounter today with another person equally interested. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, a lot of it is, as it, as is true with academics, through reading, not through direct experience. I can't say I've walked along the Boulevard Côte Saint-Antoine, which is where I live, and I know neighbors who've been abducted from their backyards, <laughs> put it that way. I wish I could say that, probably, yeah. not to their benefit, but Maybe to they my wish own. they could talk about it, too. But, uh, maybe they do, too. <laughs> but I can't say I can. Fair enough. Um, in... Uh, Excuse me. No, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um... In the class that you that you taught, mm -hmm. now this is a class. This is a, you explained to me like a voluntary uh, thing, oh, right? right? Yeah, people would uh, after graduation would come oh. back for this course. This was called the McGill Community for Lifelong Learning, and right. I taught a course there for several years. By the way, I offered to teach it again in 2023, and you know what they said? They turned me down. Really? Which was a surprise to me and a shock. I was ready to go again and you know spend uh, about ten lectures, which is wow. what it lasted, and it was taught in their, as I said, non-credit. A uh, low-cost yeah. adult education program. Yeah, and I had done that program for a couple of years. And the last time I volunteered, no thanks, we've had enough. And there was some kind of snar snide email that was sent about, uh, we don't think there's much in this anymore. Oh, I was really wow. disappointed by that. I have that to say, that is disappointing. And I was a, a shout out to McGill for having done it before, and a critique for not having done it the last time I asked. That's right. Thank you, McGill. Do better <laughs> next time. And since you're my 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 source of Retirement income, do better, please. <laughs> I'm still connected. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, McGill, do better. Yeah. Um, what uh, What are some things that you taught during that course? Like, let's say oh. I would attend this course. What are th some things that I'm going to learn about? Well, I'd go back through history. I'd go back to the early encounters with UFOs that people reported, both from the late 19th century, these airships that people were reporting, and then like the Foo Fighters. Let, or? No, no, even before that. Before that, this like, was back in the in the. They, th they saw what they thought were balloons because balloons were in the air then. Mm -hmm. Airplanes had been just invented in, in 1903, 1904. But in the 1890s, people were seeing, quote, airships, unquote, wow. uh, which were thought to be balloons, but which by the visual accounts were much too complicated and too big to be balloons. But the first well-recorded events were during the Second World War in the 1940s. Uh, So-called Foo Fighters, which is the name of a rock band as well, mm -hmm. These were seen over Germany by yeah. pilots flying On, over from Germany. Both sides. From both sides, yeah. yeah. By German fighters and by American bombers yeah. and, and English bombers. These were globes that flew alongside the airplanes and couldn't be explained and f did things that the airplanes couldn't do. That was in the late 40s, obviously, during the war. 
Shortly after that, after the war, came the sightings we all know so much about, the Roswell encounters, the close encounters uh, in the 1947s mm-hmm. of uh, crashed UFO remains and, and the bodies therein. and the cover-up therein. So all of that began right after the Second World War. During the Cold War, the government started lying about it, the U.S. government immediately. Uh, people started reporting and forming UFO groups interested in this right after it. And as I said, I was a kid then. This was 1947. It was in the, n- the newspapers and the magazines. And I was reading the newspapers and magazines, but I was in no, no position to pay attention to write books or to, uh, to go convince people that this was interesting. It just was interesting. Yeah. And it was interesting to me as a 10-year-old. Yeah, That's and, for sure. I guess you didn't know to, uh, to what extent uh, that headline uh, would have an impact on you know the rest of humanity. Uh, you know when that initial crash happened, and they said UFO or flying saucer, flying saucer, flying Fly- saucer. Yeah. And I didn't know what it was, <laughs> yeah. and I was fascinated. And you know, that, and from then on, mm-hmm. now that history is all recorded. Yeah. people have written about it. Lots more people than me, and I, I know about it. Yeah, through the books and through what people the, have written. Yeah. The Belgian UFO wave in '89. I just, right. I just uh, recently stumbled on this. I didn't mm-hmm. know about this one. Mm-hmm. There's so many cases. Actually. Oh gosh, people. Yes, yeah. You know, uh, people think it's all, there's like, oh, there's three sightings. Uh-huh. No, there are thousands. There are thousands. You're and, absolutely right. And and every single, like, I mean, sure, you can chalk a lot of them up to whatever you like, whatever the reason. No. But, but some of them really are inexplicable because when you're talking about several... Uh, you, you're, you're talking about military personnel, you're talking about like police officers, like uh, people who are in a credible line of work. And by credible, I mean uh, as an eyewitness. Yes. Um, and, 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 and cross-referencing, you know, they don't know each other, they haven't spoken together, and they're saying the same thing. Well, that is evidence. Yes. That is proof. That's evidence. Yeah. That's legal evidence. That's legal evidence. And Absolutely. as I said, I just mentioned I do legal work <laughs> as That's a consultant. Right. Yeah. And I appreciate the, the strength of legal evidence. Yeah. And when you get it together and put it together, it's credible, human uh, explanation of something humans have seen and yeah. experienced, period. Yeah, that, that's, uh, most people think, like, they're like, oh, if there's UFOs, where's the evidence? There is evidence. Oh, there's plenty of evidence. There's plenty of evidence. Plenty of evidence. Plenty of evidence. There might not be any uh, smoking gun right now, right. but there, there is definitely evidence to suggest that there is a gun somewhere. <laughs> well, usually, the government gets there and picks up the pieces first. That's right. And uh, they also control most of the media yeah. that record these things, like mm. the uh, radars yeah. and the fighter planes that report them and chase them, uh, a lot of it. And the, the, the media they don't control are, of course, the personal sightings that people report yeah. when they've seen them looking out of airplanes or flying airplanes. As I yeah. mentioned, I've talked to a pilot who went wingtip to wingtip with one for a long distance. On a Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, Oh, that just occurs? I met a pilot at a MUFON UFO conference, and he was talking about his experience. And I quote, flying wingtip to wingtip with a UFO for a long distance. I can't recall the details, so he hadn't written them down. But that was a firsthand personal account by a credible and qualified witness who at a UFO conference was telling me informally what he was probably reporting at another uh, here you know another event that I didn't go to so wow. that kind of thing is not uncommon it really isn't we know that and if i'm talk if i talk to one conference one guy at one uf one time how many other people in exactly the same position pilots qualified observers who've been in the air have seen the same kind of thing and the kind of military pilots who simply can't talk about it that's right. And and you said something really uh, important there. You said qualified observer. Yeah. And I think that's uh, something that we have to keep in mind when hearing accounts yes. is that something coming from me might not be as credible. And I understand that. But when you have somebody who can read read the, the sky, their whole yeah. job is to look out the window and to be able to tell you the conditions that he's looking at yes. and to be able to read what's on you know, his uh, data collection devices and, and to be able to translate that, these people are qualified observers. These are people we should be believing. There are hundreds and thousands of these people who've reported UFOs or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Uh, UAPs. UAPs. Or, uh, yeah. Extraterrestrial vehicles is what yeah. I call them because that's what they are. Do, so, what do you make of this uh, interdimensional, uh, interdimensional talk? All the, all the uh, that they might be transmedium or not transmedium, but transdimensional devi- uh, uh, vehicles. It's beyond my skill set. Mm-hmm. I'm serious. 
I'm not a physicist. Right. I don't know how to discuss mm -hmm. the, the structure of the universe in a way that would add anything to this argument, simply because that's not my trade. Fair. My trade was uh, visual perception memory and psychology. Mm -hmm. And I have to concede to other people to make a good story for that or a good explanation for it. So somebody who, who works in assessing uh, people's perception, mm -hmm. uh, you're obviously you're obviously well equipped to look at someone and not spot if they're lying, but spot inconsistencies in a story and, and maybe the reasons for those inconsistencies psychologically as well. Uh, that's something that you're capable of doing. Uh, you know, you have probably a really keen observation into the human psyche. <laughs> well, let's, let's not go overboard on me first. Now, I'll tell you why. My psychology training was all in research. Mm -hmm. I have never in my life sat down in front of a person and been paid to help them get over some kind of mental difficulty. I see. So I am not a clinical psychologist in mm -hmm. any sense. I have a great deal of respect for people who can do that. I have talked to, obviously, UFO witnesses, but I would never qualify myself mm -hmm. as somebody who could sort the wheat from the chaff right. in human behavior by looking or talking to a person. But you would be able to discern the reason for them uh, 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 telling a story. Yes, I would mostly be totally sympathetic to people who've seen things like this, mm -hmm. but I'd be never in a position to try and... and and denounce them, denounce them yeah. or, or to take their story apart. The people I've met who are witnesses, mm -hmm. and, and I suppose the most direct ones are the people that we were talking about in St. Adolf to Howard, just around mm -hmm. the corner, so to speak, uh, that not, well, not that long ago, uh, are people whose integrity I trust because I sat with them long enough to get to know them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you too, <Yeah. laughs> put it that way. And there are other people, not many, in the UFO world who had that kind of close encounter. Yeah. And I don't know any people right now who I'm on close terms with who I would say are recovering abductees, to put it that way. Understood. And there are people who have gone through those experiences and have learned to live with them. Uh, again, as I said, um, Barney and Betty Hill, for yeah. one, and, and their niece Kathleen. But, uh, you know. what is What do you see is the future of disclosure the future of this this knowledge coming out how do you see this moving forward what do you where do you see us going we're in the middle of it right now and the middle of it is more active than it's ever been and that started well it started a while ago but it's been growing in strength mm -hmm. and 2017 20, we had oh the, yeah uh, that's right the there Post, were early or... that's right there were early stories and then yeah, in 2023 sure. there was the senate hearing on uh what do they call them uaps yep. unidentified aerial phenomena that's right and U.S. senators took it seriously, mm -hmm. and still do, and uh, other people from the U.S. legislative branch took it seriously, and still do. So I think we're in the beginning of what people used to call disclosure, mm -hmm. which is when all of this is going to impact the general public, because they realize that people with what you might call uh, credentials in the communications world take mm -hmm. it seriously. Mm -hmm. And that now includes the Senate committee, their witnesses, some of the people who re reported Ryan Graves, uh, David Fravor, these American mm -hmm. fighter pilots who've seen them yeah. and reported them and whose cameras have recorded them. This is all now coming into public focus mm -hmm. better than it ever has before. And the government is still pushing back. I think we said this earlier. There's a guy who's hired by the all-domain anomaly yeah, re tip thing to yeah. denounce all this, and he's still denouncing it. All-domain anomaly resolution arrow. Thank, thank you. Something arrow, like yeah. that. Sean Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick is the bad guy's name. Yes. And he's still saying it's a lot of, I won't use the bad word. Yeah. On you can uh, say it. <laughs> no, a lot of shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's not. And yeah. uh, I think the public is now beginning to come around to this, as is the legislative branch of at least the uh, U.S. government. We'll yeah. see. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's such a, it's such an interesting thing. But you know, alongside that, you also have to deal with, uh, you know, this sort of ontological shock oh, God, yeah. that's going to happen, or that is currently yes. happening. How do you, how do you think we're going to deal with that? It's something I've thought about, but had not thought to write about. And here's why: I know it's going to happen, and I'm a psychologist in trade, but my trade is just slightly off center on this problem. How do we deal with? the billions of humans who finally realize 
we're not even in charge of our old world. And well, we've done a good job of that. We haven't. But not only have we done a bad job, now there are other people outside poking and prodding at us. And how is this going to affect the way we look at it ourselves, our universe, our governments, our, our wives, our children, our mistresses, our friends? It's going to change all of this. And I have not started to try and organize this in my own mind because it's very, very complicated. It is. I hope people who are thinking, who appreciate the problem, as we do, and have better social psychology credentials than I do, begin to take this very seriously. I might be forced to do it myself if nobody else does, <laughs> but I'm looking for the social psychologist or the clinical psychologist or the psychiatrist who knows this world well enough and takes the UFO evidence seriously enough to begin to put out their informed professional opinions about how it's going to deal, how the humanity is going to deal with this and how we as humanity have to deal with it ourselves. I hope this comes. I don't think I'm the first person to write this book. Mm -hmm. I hope somebody else does or produce the podcast. Yeah. Or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a I think it's a fascinating discussion even just to have because, you know, we if you look at the past, we also have evidence of us meeting uncontacted tribes. I know oh, in, gosh, yes. in Australia there yeah. was a whole documentary made. Um, I forget what the documentary is, but there were the uh, the indigenous people to Australia that mm -hmm. were that were there, and they'd never encountered the mm -hmm. white man before. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you see on film for the first time these people reacting to a vehicle. I'd never seen that. That sounds now, like fascinating. Now this is exactly what we would look like if we saw a flying saucer, well, Be because oh, that technology yeah. is alien to them, and these strange bipedal people look familiar but they're also different <laughs> they have right. a different skin color that's right. they have a different face shape that's they're wearing right. funny clothes that's right they're aliens that's right and and that's when right. watching this well put. yeah and you mm -hmm. see the reaction to mm -hmm. it it is fright you're frightened for them mm -hmm. and uh, you know it got me thinking i was like well that's yeah. we're in for a bit of a rude awakening we are and again as i said i apologize to you basically and to your listeners and viewers, that I can't give you an answer to this. Hmm. There are better qualified people than me who better take this up and deal with the social implications, the political yeah. implications, the personal psychiatric implications. It all has got to be done. I've spent my time writing about what I think are the facts mm -hmm. and not dealing with the social side of this, which is a very important side of it. Yeah. Very important. Do you think we're ready? No. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll find a way of dealing with it. But I, I even think even somebody who's well prepared, you know, might think they're prepared until oh, the yeah. moment exactly. comes. Exactly, exactly. The emotions might be stronger than you think. Yeah, that might sure. be you know that you know from from whispers and and you hear things, but that seems to be the reason we're not being openly contacted is that we're not seemingly ready for it. You mean they're looking at us with a certain amount of trepidation as well. Yeah. We don't want to come down and mess their lives up totally. Yeah. Maybe. that could Or be. mess ourselves up. Or mess yourselves up. But they're certainly looking, yeah. and they're picking around, as you and as every person who studied the productions knows. They're picking around with us. They're yeah. looking at some of us anyway and putting us back yeah. and dealing with us. And you've heard the hybrid stories too, I'm sure. We haven't got into that. We but can. there's uh, there's evidence. Uh, in fact, a book written by a guy who lives uh, not that far from here in Mont Tremblant, Marc Saint Germain. I wrote mm -hmm. the introduction to his book. It's called Les Enfants de Sylvie P. It's a book in, written in French about a woman living in uh, the Laurentians, who was abducted and inseminated, and whose hybrid children were taken away from her. Wow! But this is not a common story. This is that side of it, which I'm I've never written much about because I haven't dealt with that mm -hmm. much of this side of the picture, but it's there. They do mess around with us. They're interested. Genetically. And genetically. They're interested to the degree that and now I'm going on what your, your podcast watchers will realize is the far edge, but it's an edge I'm convinced is correct, although I'm not a scholar in this edge yeah. of what's happening, and that is direct intervention with human life by creating critters, that look like us, can be mistaken for us, but have psychic abilities and are hybrids with humans wow. and ETs. And again, that's from this neighborhood. Yeah, that's Marc Saint Germain's book. It's very, uh, yeah, very interesting and such a you know for anybody, 
you know, my audience, I, I think, is is a mix of people who are familiar with the topic and a mm-hmm. mix of people who are new to yeah. the topic. So, yeah. you know, hearing hearing things like that obviously can be a little off putting for a lot of people out there. But you also have to understand that there are decades and decades and thousands and thousands of there's information, there's right. people coming forward. Right. Uh, within the government too, that that you know we don't hear about, and some we do hear about as well. But there, there's witnesses, there's yes. eyewitnesses, there's firsthand witnesses yes. Yes. to a lot of these things, to abductions, yes. to you know even you you want to go so uh, cattle mutilations, yes, and, of course, of course. Uh, you know the things that happened on Skinwalker Ranch, oh, gosh, and, yes. uh, you know yes. things that were reported there that the government was a part of. How long do we want to go on with this? Because we've got another two hours to talk about this. <laughs> You're right. And we've you've just got us into something that I haven't hardly mentioned at all and don't mention much in my books because I'm dealing more with the observables mm-hmm. and with the, what you might call the collated evidence. But the personal side of this, the, uh, the, uh, the alien intrusions into human life, the mm-hmm. hybridization, which does go on, and which I don't deal much with, but is real, is something that is anxiety-producing for the human species, right. for obvious reasons. Yeah. Because we may not be the, quote, human, unquote, species anymore. We mm. may be a species of hybrids who might live on Earth as we have been, but with a little more close relationship to the people who are coming and looking at us. And that might be in our best interest. It might not. We don't know. I don't know. That's the scary part right there. Yes, that's right. Is that we don't, we, we are no longer the apex. On earth, correct. Yeah, realizing that is a big pill for us to swallow because, you know, oh, yeah. we've fought so hard to become the number one. And what's going to happen, once this, once we begin to talk about disclosure, which is a word that people used many years ago, is that we're going to be fighting about it. I don't mean physically fighting. I mean verbally fighting, I hope not physically fighting, mm-hmm. with what to do about it and how to deal with it. And our government institutions, and we in the West, fortunately, live in places with relatively advanced government institutions that allow us to talk about these things mm-hmm. without confronting, confronting each other with murder or mayhem right. or violence or, uh, or uh, ostracism. We've got to deal with this as a public as, an, as a better informed public and figure out how, as a species, we deal with this. And of course, as a species, we're not united to start with. That's right. We have the West, quote unquote. We have other parts of the world which don't share the same government systems that we do, mm-hmm. which are in somewhat less stable conditions for dealing with public events. I mean, we can take it from there and go on for another three hours <laughs> on human civilization and its discontents. But other people have been there before, and we're still we're living with the fact that, well, we, goodness, well, well, live in Canada and the U.S. and manage this extremely well, along with some other parts of the world. Other people don't. Where, um, what do you say to those people who, who, because online, you know, people will get their own, will make their own narratives up and mm-hmm. and run with the most popular theory uh, at the at the time. But when people say, why do the, why are these things only happen in in North America? Why aren't they happening anywhere else? <laughs> they do happen elsewhere. You just don't know about it. That's right. And that's because the news doesn't get around, and account things that happen in the middle of uh, Central Africa, or uh, even in the middle of China, aren't going to be reported. Period. They, they happen, and you get these reports out uh, through the grapevine, mm-hmm. but you don't get them reported by the Daily News or even uh, the MUFON uh, in- International because they're not well known. Yeah. They happen. We they just do don't, happen, We yeah. just don't happen the same. We don't have the same direct reporting system. And some, uh, some of these cases are even more impressive than a lot of the cases that we've, uh, that we've seen over here. Like you look at the Virginia uh, crash that happened in Brazil. Uh, yeah. You look at the UFO wave in Belgium. Yes. Uh, you know, we can look in, uh, I mean, there's just... Uh, oh, gosh, yes. Uh, all over the world, South Africa, Zimbabwe. Yeah. The, <laughs> French ones. <laughs> yep. Not just Quebec, but France also, in for France sure. France as well. Right. That's right. Russia. That's right. That's uh, right. A lot of sightings uh, that we brought back, thanks to uh, George Knapp, a lot of information we got back uh, after the Cold War that mm-hmm. uh, he went there and... Mm-hmm. And brought some, so yeah, that's that's in Japan as well. There's, right. Uh, I mean, there's. So I'm just exciting. a dull academic researcher. I don't know half of the stuff that a lot of people do, and have written about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I agree with you, and it's happening all over. And what the ultimate motive? And it may be more than one. Of course, yeah. there may be more than one species of extraterrestrial yeah. dealing with us, whether they have agreements among themselves or mm-hmm. not. 
We don't know. That's fascinating. We don't even know whether our own governments are in contact with any of these people. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, one has one's suspicions, yeah. but there's no direct What are knowledge. your suspicions? Probably, yes. In some, in Do you some think Eisenhower had the meeting? Uh, there's a I know rumors the, of yeah, Eisenhower. I, know. I don't know. I don't know. I can't. I won't go beyond not saying I don't know, because okay. I don't. I'm nowhere close to what some of you, and I expect you as well, are in dealing with this layer of information that hasn't gotten itself. Remember, I'm the dull academic. Mm-hmm. hasn't gotten hasn't gotten itself into published papers or books that can be reviewed and so forth and so on. There's a lot of it still out there mm-hmm. that I don't know for sure. Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to uh, discover it in the next few years, and hopefully, articles like these. We've got all these articles here on the. <laughs> On yeah. the desk that are uh, Air Force says saucers freaks and uh, around a bend they saw a pair of bulging eyes. Yeah, that that's the one I hadn't seen before. That's <laughs> neat. Woman UFO buzz my car says woman. Well, that's happened more than once. Yes, it has. Flying saucer seen over Washington for a second time in four days. Oh, that's that's well known, of course. Yeah, the big Washington flap. That's, that's right. Fifty two. Fifty two. Fifty two. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, I think we students of the subject know it's been out there. And it's been out there for years. Yeah. And uh, but we don't know the full story. That's for sure. I don't pretend. You think to. we'll ever know? Well, the full story. Well, do we know the full story about anything? Do we that's... know the full story about the French Revolution? Yeah. Not totally. Um, yeah. And, but I mean, there's. Oh, and uh, we, as a species, have a limited capacity for absorbing knowledge. That's right. Those of us, you know, who do it, and enjoy it, are doing as best we can. Yeah. But. There's a there's a there's, there's a maximum. A, there's, amount. A maximum. there's a maximum. It's though. like a, you can't teach arithmetic to a dog, but you might be able to teach him like one plus two equals three cookies That's or something, right? right? That's right. Absolutely. But, uh, but there is a we there's don't know a cap. We don't know what our cap is, and yeah. uh, we don't know if it's being genetically modified by outsiders right now either. That's yeah. what we've just been talking about. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's a big one. That's a yeah, big one to that's a big one to, to to wrap my head around. And even when so-called disclosure is open and has happened. And the public, whatever that means, knows that we're being looked at by ETs, Mm -hmm. whatever that means, and accepts this. The implications of all of this will take a long time to absorb and to deal with. And they are very subtle. And then, uh, and then they'll hit you up for another course at McGill. <laughs> maybe they'll, not. They'll, they'll reneg on their last. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. On their last decision. They'll be like, you know what? Maybe, maybe you should come back. <laughs> well, maybe. I hope so. That was fun, and I enjoyed it. All right. And that keeps me busy. All right. Well, uh, Don, thank you. You've been a wonderful guest. It's been so it's, fascinating it's been my talking pleasure. to you. It's been my pleasure. It really, really, really uh, just I, I could I could sit here for hours and do this. Uh, you know, it wouldn't bug me at all. It'd be my pleasure. Uh, but guys, uh, thank you for watching. Um, I want you guys to go and check out uh, these books that Don put out. I left the links below to them. I believe there's also are, are there audio books as well available? Uh there's a Kindle. There's a Kindle uh, version, a Kindle, so there's Kindle a digital version, version yeah, that digital people can version. pick up. Audio, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Highly suggest you guys go pick this up. Uh, go support uh, Don Don Derry on his research on UFOs and ETs, the truth, the lies, and all that stuff. And uh, I want to thank you once again for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting thank you. me. Thanks, guys, and we'll see you on the next one. <laughs>